Aloha and welcome back to the Cyber Underground, where our mission is to dig deep to find out how cybersecurity touches all of our lives every day. I'm your host, Dave, this uh, cyber guy, and this is uh, my exceptional co host. <laughs> did, he, did he forget his name? Uh, I forgot my <laughs> did name. Did he forget his name? It's a Friday. Good You're morning. Dave, the cyber guy? Excuse me. Okay. Uh, oh, you must face the camera. That was awesome. I've done that. Don't worry about it. This is Andrew, the security guy. Aloha, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And our uh, wonderful uh, guest today, Jody Ito from the University of Hawaii System. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Very thanks happy for to coming be here down. with both of you. Oh, we're right. so happy to have you on here. And I really needed to drink more before we started. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know. Maybe not. I mean, <laughs> Maybe not. I, I've never seen one forget their own name. It's pretty good. <sighs> Gordo yeah, forgets yeah. my name, but that was It's good. all the millions of viewers that we have live. I'm there sure. you go. Oh, you're nervous. I'm it, yeah. totally nervous every time. Wow. It. it just happens. So, Jody. Yes. How did you get here? How did you become what you are? So I drove in a car in traffic and went, no, just joking. So nice. <laughs> That's okay. I, I totally so, get it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'm actually a, a product of the University of Hawaii Toys Over. So I have a bachelor's of science in computer sciences as well as a master's. Wow. And um, very fortunate, I started a student employee at the computing center back then. Really? For academic computing. Oh, right on. And then, I didn't know that. Yeah, shortly after graduation, a full-time job opened up. And I thought, you know, mom says earn money. <laughs> so you take whatever jobs <laughs> whatever available, job. right? <laughs> so I did, thinking I'm going to only stick around for a few years. And then, like, my friends were going to go hit it off to the mainland, or, you know, for those big uh, defense contractors. And, but, uh, you know, the job was actually very, very interesting. And it changed over years. And uh, one thing really good about the university is you get to see all of the things change and move and progress, right? Because we have to be teaching these things to the kids. Yeah. So it, it was a very dynamic environment. And so 35 years later, it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm still here. So Now, you're the you're chief information security officer? Correct. Wow. So CISO, and I was just, I got to say, I'm amazed at your leadership structure. First of all, you got president of the university, David Lasner. Correct. IT guy. Yep. Right. Absolutely. And then you got Garrett, who was on the show last yep. week, super IT guy, yes. and goes to David if he needs help. Absolutely. And so you have Garrett. Yes. And you guys, what a great team. They plan, oh, they plan it that way. Absolutely. The IT has taken over. So, so uh, to be good. honest, it, it's because <laughs> yeah. David Lasner was actually my supervisor very, very early on. Oh, awesome. And it's largely because of his leadership, um, his vision, and uh, we stayed. A whole group of us just stayed. And then we're very fortunate that when he became president, eventually Garrett, who was originally a director under David initially, um, he left and then he came back when David mm. was president. So right. it worked out really, really, I feel very, very fortunate. You guys have a super team yep. and I think you're getting a lot done. And there's a, there's a lot of cybersecurity going on throughout Absolutely. the entire university system. Yes. You guys manage uh, 10 campuses, yes. right? But that's there's more physical campuses. Like Hawaii Community College has two physical campuses now. Correct. Yeah, so it's Hilo. campuses by legal entity, right? Mm -hmm. But each of these campuses have multiple locations, as you alluded to. Not to mention all of the research facilities that are out. So Coconut Island, for example, oh, right. is still part yeah. of the university. You have telescopes on the top of Mauna Kea and Haleakala. Mm -hmm. um, you have a lot of these research projects that have sensors out all over the well, place. The seismic the sensors water, too, yeah. Not even seismic energy oh, yeah. grid. Oh. Um, People who need to test devices you know, out in the field, they'll do that. So it, it's really big and all security nightmare. <laughs> yeah, I think we snuck in that R&D piece last week because I was interested yeah, how it's right. part of, segregated mm -hmm. from, right. you got the student body. you got a, you got a quite a, a mixed environment to manage there. So from the university's perspective, right, we actually have to have academics where the students are very free and the researchers are very free to access what they need, collaborate with whomever they need to collaborate with, um, get to almost anywhere. And then we also have the business environment from the university, much like any other corporation. Um, the things around personnel information, uh, student information as their academic records. We talk about the financial information system. Uh, we're a university. We have to track and we have to have data. So we have a longitudinal data across um, what we call the operational data store. So 
academic research, innovation. Um, you know, we basically have every little piece of, of businesses that you can think of. Wow. And you keep a, a big dashboard of that, like in your pocket? <laughs> <laughs> you get on your little smart. Oh, so I don't know exactly what's to, going on. To that, yeah, to we're that at, environment, What metrics right? are you looking at? Oh, how my do, gosh. How do we protect so all of that? And so we, we actually have to prioritize. Yeah, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of risk surface Absolutely. to deal with. Yeah. Right? How do and you manage that? Especially because of the research and education piece, we have to have wide open networks. We don't really have um, ways to put up filters where we can prevent people from going to certain, maybe even known bad sites. Mm. Perhaps Garrett the, was telling us that it's your dirty network. Yeah. Gotta, no, 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 no. You gotta let them. You gotta let them ride. Or? We're not a dirty network. We're a hostile network. Oh, Host that's even maybe well, worse. I don't know. Get up a level now. Well, yeah. Because if you think about it, right? We, you can bring your computer, your device to the compu uh, network at the university. And we don't have any way of saying, no, we're going to put you through some device check to make sure you're mm. clean before you can get on our network. Because okay. lots of times it's visiting faculty, visiting colleagues that need to come in and jump on the network immediately. And they have to be able to do whatever they need to and do. And those devices could already be compromised when they Absolutely. get on your network. Yeah. Majority of time, they are compromised other places, and oh, then they bring yeah. them to the university. Ouch. And yeah. so, you know, students bring their laptops, and majority of the time, they actually ha are infected with something. And so we might actually see alerts. But if it's on a part of our network that someplace like our wireless network where mostly our students are on, mm. and it's a what we call a dynamic address where we don't know exactly who's using it at any given time, we're going to say we're, we're not going to be able to identify that unique That's just a transient computer. address on your network somewhere. Correct. They transient. pop on, pop Correct. off. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Anonymous as far as you so, know. So you see that the outbound connection is a problem. It's connecting to some... That, or we also get external reports that people, like uh, the multi-state ISAC that we belong to, stands for the Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Right. Uh, it's um, to help state organizations to help protect their assets. So we actually are members, so they actually help monitor some of our ad address space. And they'll you know, send us emails that say, you know, these uh, IPs are exhibiting uh, behaviors of compromised hosts. Mm -hmm. Sure. If it's in a part of the network that is largely our transient network, as we consider it, there's not much we can do. We can't even identify the computer that it came from. So, but it's firewalled from any valuable R and D side. So it's you know it's kind of like okay. So we actually have to segregate or architect our network into different zones, mm -hmm. uh, so that we create a more uh, secure area for those things that are very very important for us and then for example the wireless that's generally available we think of that as part of the hostile network hostile oh, because yeah. you don't know what's we'll give it to it. you but we consider you hostile <laughs> if you're using it and you're on it you're a part of the problem well it just means that we Fair don't enough. have a way of easily um, being able to manage it so that we sure. can get it cleaned off and things like that it's, so. it's interesting we talked about that last week that whole the convenience versus security Absolutely. piece right so right. I can't like let you use it and then like lock you down right that, that's a problem right. so it's, okay. it's benevolent of the university to take that risk on right yeah. so how, how do you decide to how do you meter that how what's the what's the concern about that that component or do you so the concern is it so isolated no you know? we actually have um, what we can call a data governance process oh. so we identify and categorize data based on their criticality and sensitivity. A lot of it is based on just regulations, right? So okay. for example, uh, payment card industry data, you know, sure. if that's breach, right? Credit card numbers, very sensitive, social security numbers. Um, yeah, title so nine, right? Title ways nine, in there, sure. exactly. So we have ways of categorizing our information. And that information, which is very, very sensitive, we put more controls around. Mm. So we actually will have processes like if you want to use, for example, um, student academic records for research or anything, you actually need to go through a data sharing request process mm. where people would have to approve that before you can just use that data. Good. So, yeah. Good. yeah. I want that to be the case. And it's a, it's a process, right? So it's not just about technology and procedures, it's this whole education of the community. Right? How do you make sure that the people using this data, managing this data, understand the risks around it and therefore how to protect it? That's, I, I love the fact That's that you've awesome. gone through asset classification. 
you know what everything's worth, how much you want to spend on securing it, how secure it has to be, if it's open, if it's not open, what segment of the network do you put it on, if it's classified versus not classified. And you also share a lot of intelligence, right, with other organizations like the DHS, FBI, NSA. So in general, what they will do is they normally notify us if they see um, unusual or anomalous activities that is of interest to them. And each of these different three-letter agencies have different, I guess, priorities, sure. right? So really? I, oh, I thought they were all the same. <laughs> yeah. Shock and we're amazement. We're all the same government, so uh, that's strange. Uh, so uh, we actually have to work with many of the different agencies differently. So NCIS, FBI, um, DHS, uh, Air Force. So. NCIS, it's real. It's, it's real. real. They, they are real. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sure. But it's real. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, and again, they're looking for different things. And so we will respond to them in different ways based on their what they share with us and what we'll share back with them. So when you, when you collect all this threat intelligence, uh, how do you analyze it? Where do you keep that information? How do you go through it? What's your dashboard I tell like? you I'm going to have to kill you. Oh, I see. No, so I mean, you're, really. You're the CIA, too. Well, no, <laughs> if, if you think about it, right? The information that we gather from these types of security devices actually gives up a lot of information about mm. the university and the assets. Uh, yeah. So that is something that we try not to share very widely. So a lot of times when they want, for example, network, log, network logs from us, we actually try to sanitize it some degree. So they might be able to see where it's trying to uh, connect to, mm -hmm. but we won't give up the endpoint. Sure. Right, so yep. we actually do try to protect the um, privacy of university devices. So mm -hmm. you approached a new That's subject. Awesome. So this is this yeah. is brand new, I think, to cybersecurity that people are realizing that big data has a huge role to play oh, in cybersecurity. Let me just tell you, anytime <laughs> you're using one of those online coupon things like Retail Me Not that offer you coupons as you mm. go to their stores, even yep. when you are uh, belong to those loyalty shopping programs, sure. CVS, you get everything, you thing, everything they're recording what you're buying, okay. how often you're buying, yeah. um, are you a cat person or a dog person, you know, Amazon kills me, right? You jump on, you look at a few things, and the next time you go back on, they go, well, based on what you looked at the last time, we recommend you look sure. at these things. That's all data analysis. And data can be captured anywhere. So for people out there looking for jobs, besides cybersecurity as being a huge, huge need, yeah. data analyst, yeah. right? Well, we were Back talking with science. our IT advisor, the yep. data visualization, data visualization. And, and big data analysis. Absolutely. Uh, but it's heavy in statistics, right? You, you, your pathway is computer science and statistics and the, the traditional engineering pathway towards this field. Or it yeah. could be in mathematics, right? So it, it might not be hardcore sciences, but it's going to be one of those hybrid fields where you would be able to act, it could be even marketing, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think for sure on the ML side, you yeah. know, machine learning machine piece, learning, right? Machine learning, right. That, that ability to take take that data and, and, and manipulate it for the business right. mm -hmm. or for a purpose yes. right. or for the sake of the information itself, right? There's the, the outputs of, of what can be learned the analysis is much faster done by machine learning than people. So Correct. people can, can you query get answers it. that you didn't ask questions for. Right. 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 So exactly. stuff comes out. You go, I didn't even think and about that. that. Yeah. And if you throw the visualization piece on it, right, you can actually imagine data in different ways that you would not be able to envision just looking at it in paper, mm. right? In a in a line based, you know, what kind of two Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah me ask me. I look at a spreadsheet. Like, oh, that's boring. Uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> but, I'm right. <laughs> yeah, but, but machine, like you said, it, it adds to the creative right. uh, capacity yeah. of, of, of even just exploring what something means. But what does all that, that data mean? Exactly. But with that, with all of our devices now, right, your phone has a GPS. Are you making sure that it's not actually giving up your location when you don't want it to be? No. So, oh, I wish I was. Yeah. It's, it's hard because you have to go into every single app and turn off the GPS <laughs> setting for it. And it uh, becomes Christine very... finds me wherever I'm at. You know that. <laughs> well, that's because she in injected that chip in you your think, Is that what it is? <laughs> it's not a chip. It's in your dental. Remember when you went to the dentist and did that filling? Is that, that what it is? Where, that's Absolutely. Where it is. Yeah. Well, and so with that, though, we just don't know where we're leaking our information mm, to. And that's more point. of a, con a concern for me. Good point. Right. So, uh, okay. So this what is what about me. students like who are not are even less aware, right? Willing to give up just. And and I think the students that grew up in this technology age, they're much more willing to do that because 
they were socialized in this mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. For right, me, right. coming from a mainframe punch card environment, it's really <laughs> I hard. I did punch cards. Oh, I'm, with yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. So it, it's really hard for me to give up that uh, idea of privacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's interesting how the, how quickly they or they're not worried about it. Right. And I don't know what the implications are for them up the road, but you know that's yeah. a some people definitely privacy's risen in this in this world of identity what is an that digital identity oh, they give up so much the freedom. privacy side so the yeah. students want to be known they just put it all out there for them everyone to read and and in it's building also a reputation too especially right they're they're young they need to get their name out there they need jobs so how do you get to be known you put your things out there mm -hmm. um, but it can also how, uh, affect you negatively, right? So let's say you have some views you're very passionate about and then you apply for a job, but it's at odds with your prospective employer. Sure, sure. Right? So do I think we've got to take a break you? real quick. Yeah. Uh, I just got okay. the message. We're going to take a little oh, break. We'll okay. come back in one wow. Aloha. You can join the Hawaii Farmer Series every Thursday from 4 to 5 on ThinkTech. And I'm your co-host, Matthew Johnson, here with Justine Espiritu. And we are so thankful to have this show to use as a forum to get to know all the movers and shakers in agriculture in Hawaii and hear kind of their background in history as well as uh, their perspective on what they're doing and also the future for agriculture in Hawaii. So join us every Thursday. You can tweet in your own comments and suggestions and be a part of the conversation at Think Tech High. And we hope to see you every single Thursday. Hmm. Hello, welcome back to the Cyber Underground. I'm Dave, the security guy, here with uh, our exceptional co-host, Andrew, the security guy. I thought you were the cyber guy, I'm and I'm the, the security guy. guy. <laughs> I gotta get that. We don't know. We, we're not sure who we are, but you know. That's the Basically, end of my But we're here. The just important just, person is Jody, who's just, with us. Thanks for Jody coming out, Jody. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, let's talk about how you balance at the university the the difference between the physical and the data security. I mean, that that's got to be a hard balance. Physical right? security and data security. Yeah. Okay. So actually, um, the university again is an open campus. Most offices don't really have um, swipe cards or entry, uh, you know, access controls into mm. their spaces because again, we're a university, um, and I think that's a little bit of a harder challenge for um, university personnel to wrap their arms around because they're just not used to it. So when we actually have our new building, it's uh, brand new, maybe about three years now. We actually built it. Um, specifically for information technology. It houses our main data center, and we actually built, as we architected it, with control, access controls. And it was, we actually had to go through a whole culture change for us, even as employees within IT, to get used to uh, swiping your card, to get up to the elevator to the right floor, um, accessing swipe cards just to get into the office spaces and things. So. Um, as you said, it's a delicate balance, and we need to ask ourselves, um, is it okay for some non-known person, unknown person, to get into a space that may have papers that have social security numbers on them, or even uh, servers or hard drives that may have the sensitive information? So again, it's that culture and education that needs to go on to, to tell people about it. It's working, though. Uh, for example, um, people will find uh, information on desks on paper that might have social security numbers on them. And I'll get called, you know, I found this thing out there. Uh -huh. And it's like, well, you know, please take this to the person who it belongs to and ask them to secure it. Right. So um, any opportunity that you have, you have to try to, to get them to make that cultural shift and think more about security. Yeah, the, it sounds like the awareness campaign's working when you're getting calls, you know. Yeah. So, so when you have that awareness campaign going out, it's it's interesting. We find that 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 culture of locking down is is tougher in Hawaii because it it's it's, it's yeah. an open culture. Right. And, We're and, and, Ohana, and, you're my friend. That's yeah, right. and the, the whole acceptance piece in, in, in campus safety, campus security is a concern across the nation. So it's it's right. interesting. Uh, here, it's um, uh, I, I work with a lot of the campuses, and mm -hmm. and that that idea of how do we keep some openness and then protect what we need to protect? And there's that battle right. of security and convenience, exactly. right? And right? So, you know, well, well said. Right. So, you know, um, the, we I, do. The IT building's a great example right. of 
not necessarily a compromise. It's pretty locked down. But That's very as, locked as, down. as much as it needs to be. Our, our first floor, we want to be more of an open space. That's mm -hmm. why we have mm -hmm. those large um, conference rooms on the first floor that All can right. support that. And sure. we have our, our lab there on the first floor, too. Our help desk is there. So we don't want to make it a barrier for people to come in and use some of the facilities. But we still want to protect everything else that needs to be secure. Yeah, yeah. have you proliferated this around the campus? Not just that building, but have we started It's a very difficult to uh, do that because it takes retrofitting of buildings to be able to provide that sort of access. Although what a coincidence, I'm, we have Andrew right here, and he runs Integrated Security. Well, we, so there's some, there's yeah. some of that happening. Student Services has mm -hmm. finally merged with the IT server, so they yeah. were, were able to save some money there. There's some right. things we were, were able to do to distribute those services. Um, in, in the physical security world, we want IT to own the, the server side mm. and then offer the client-side application out to the resources that needed and uh, slowly some of that's mm -hmm. starting to happen at the University of Hawaii so and, it's a and great, I think great what also needs to happen is uh, vendors like yourself who, who work on problems like that also need to make sure that you fully engage with the IT people so for example with building automation systems sometimes that didn't really happen well mm -hmm. yeah. and so all of a sudden surprise we have this server that shows up with ransomware Mm -hmm. And because nobody told us, you know, we weren't able to help them secure it. We, we you know, so yeah. it's all those types of things. Even Xerox printers, right? Those sure. are, those things have hard drives. Those have web servers on them. Now, those are those are uh, devices with a lot of security built in. You not only have access control, you have authentication, you have you have abilities on the computer for logins. Uh, certain logins can do certain things, but you also have IoT devices out there. Everything from you know just regular switches to other layer two devices to to webcams. Mm -hmm. um, this IoT thing is exploding. Absolutely. Now, how do you manage that? That's so we actually don't really. <laughs> <laughs> so it's again about the education okay. piece, right? Because normally these devices will go up in smaller units, like say um, uh, computer sciences department, just as an example. And they set up their own camera uh, surveillance system on the floors that they manage. And mm. so uh, work with their IT person to make sure that they understand how that just a video surveillance piece should be isolated on a separate network, separate from their data stuff, right? And working with all of the units like that with the education piece. So at the university, um, we're highly decentralized. So you think of ITS, my group, as managing everything. We actually don't. A lot of departments have their own IT support people. And so we rely on them to help us secure the assets in that space. So you have to dem uh, disseminate your policies Absolutely. and procedures across all those IT Absolutely. groups. Do you bring them all together a Absolutely. couple times a year? That's good. So we tried. Um, it's hard because they, they're on all islands. I think there's probably about two or 300 of them scattered wow. across okay. the University of Hawaii system. Wow. Um, so as far as I think the University of Hawaii, Garrett might have alluded to, we are one of the larger IT um, employers in the state. Right, just across well, you, all you cover a lot of a lot of people. What's the student population now across the across the University of Hawaii system? I think we're roughly around fifty thousand. That's a lot of yeah. people. Fifty thousand? Yeah. That's, and that's just I had no idea. That's just, just students. students. Yeah. And I think we're expe uh, wow. there's probably another eight thousand faculty or staff. Wow, that's a that's a lot of people to manage. It is, and, and, and we actually. It's not just them. We actually have affiliates and associates and yeah, seen alumni. It. And so in terms of uh, the number of users that we actually support through our, um, what we call our UH username, mm. I think we're somewhere up around maybe 100, 100,000 or wow, so. Wow, that's a lot of surface that's area. That's a to lot of responsibility. Yeah. And people can be the problem. People right? are always the problem, I think. Well, 90% of the people get hacked first socially. Correct. And then it, it gets them behind your firewall, yeah? All right. Well, so um, we actually have a lot of cases where we get what we call phishing runs. Run? So, because okay. it's multiple phishing campaigns. Sure. And so uh, I think within a month we could get 20 to 30 campaigns roughly, which, wow. you know, act, that's a campaign. So each campaign, there's hundreds of messages per campaign, and we actually get a number of compromised accounts because people are just so trusting, mm. right? They say it says, oh, and they, they use ITS because we're the technology group, and they'll sure. represent that they're from the help desk. And uh -huh. so, you know, we need you to enter your username and password so that we can help you mm. or whatever that phishing campaign is of that sure. moment. And people will do it. They'll put in the 
username and password. So never, ever, ever put in your username <laughs> and password. Um, if somebody asks you for it, double check. Oh, definitely. Um, and the reason they're also doing it is they're reading their emails on these tiny little mobile devices. Right. So it's hard for them to get the sense that it looks like a phishing mm -hmm. message because it's really small and they can't and see it. So, mm -hmm. and if they're reading that same message, say on a full screen, they will instantly be able to identify it's a phishing email. Mm -hmm. So, when when people are on this open Wi-Fi network, mm -hmm. you you have a system now of free VPN access through the UH system. That is correct for for university students. So, when when I log in and I'm just going to mm -hmm. into a coffee shop at UH or even to Starbucks yep. anywhere on the island, I can use my VPN from the UH system, and all my traffic is encrypted, so I don't have to worry about people you know, doing a wire shark and getting all my data? Well, it will do it until the point of when you get into the university network, right? Mm -hmm. So once you get into the university network, then you have to rely on, if you're browsing, make sure you have HTTPS and everything turned on, right? So um, again, it's just to get you into the university network. But it is a very good resource, and I actually do use it, especially in hotels. Hotel Wi-Fi, if you're getting oh, in. For sure, if you're coming from airports, outside in. Yeah, absolutely. So do you mean, it, you mean so that internally, if you, have, if you had an internal breach, someone could connect to it internally, and you may still have a man-in-the-middle type problem going on? Possibly. I see. Yeah. But um, because the university you network, back we through have... back through the VPN. <laughs> That's ugly. It <laughs> could. Ouch. It could. But we actually do have um, much more control within the university sure. network. That's why. So uh, routers and things, the ones that we manage and maintain, they're not publicly exposed. So, sure. you know, they're in locked closets. You know, some of that physical security you talked about. Yeah. So we try to implement that. So we have, I think, a little bit more comfort in knowing that within the university network, we're better at protecting that. We cannot protect you outside the university network. Oh, for sure. So I need to look for HTTPS in my browser mm -hmm. URL and I make sure that certificate's actually valid. Yes, absolutely. Like, yeah, I'm sure it's valid. That it's not I, re valid. I read this thing about this uh, puny code, right, where that if you're connecting to something that's not in English, this hack of hack of that, you can actually they they can emulate like Apple.com. Uh, it's the um, extended but, character but, set. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. But you can take that. Yeah, but. You take that and, and put it in Google, and it'll show you that it's actually not in English. Right. I, mm -hmm. I didn't know you could even do that. I was like, wow, this is a recent thing I read. Yeah, it's amazing. Because I always thought you're pr protected with HTTPS up no, there in the left always, corner. Yeah. Foolish, foolish. No, <laughs> never say wow. never. Never say never. Puny code, right, is the, the, what, what translates that uh, non-English into English. Right. And, and scary they can stuff. hack that. Yeah, and it it is. Just to, goes to show you, you need to stay a step ahead of the hacker. And it's hard right. because Keep going. there's so much information flowing at at us all the time, right? And how do you weed out the legitimate information from the stuff that could be fake, right? You know, all this stuff with fake news and stuff. And just because you read it on what appears to be a legitimate website, is that true? But if it's your website, of course it is. If it's your website, <laughs> of course it is. Well, I hope so. It, <laughs> I hope if, so. if it appears to be my website, it may actually be my website. Who knows? <laughs> it's good. Right. So how, how, that's the other part, right? How do you actually validate the information that you're, you're getting? And then, again, threats are changing so quickly. The threat vectors, how people can attack you are changing so quickly. I can't imagine sitting over top of a hundred thousand people, most of which are students doing not thinking about this stuff. Whatever yeah. they want, yeah. not no real security. Like they think you're handling their security, right? Well, they feel protected we are. in we that are, environment. We are protecting their data. Sure. Right, but and it's up to them at the endpoint level. Um, we do provide free antivirus. Uh, they can oh, good. they can email uh, for assistance to our help desk. Um, if they bring in their device, they can try to help clean them up. But for the most part, it's a personally owned device, so we actually have to teach them how to manage their device. So we actually try to do educational seminars for them, uh, teach them about phishing, teach them about how to protect your your computers. Um, but a lot of them, they're just too busy and they don't come. So how do <laughs> oh. we reach students? Kids, what could they be up to? Sure. Could they possibly be up and to. And, and how do we get them to take security seriously? Because it it is their privacy that could be compromised by themselves. This up. I, yeah. I'm getting I'm getting the message. You, you're getting the, the beep from from the the beep. Words. <laughs> wow, that was quick. Thank you for being on the show. Oh, no, thank you for having it's me. Such aloha. Thank, thank you so much. Jody should come like once a week, I think, and update us. <laughs> oh, yeah. You want to be a co host? Uh, thank uh, you. Yeah. But, uh, oh, you're doing such a fine job. Aloha, everyone. <laughs> Stay safe. All right.